It was, it was unplugged on this end. So. Take two. Good morning, everybody. It's great to, great to be worshiping with you all this beautiful morning, uh, both those of you who are worshiping with us here in the sanctuary, but also uh, those who are worshiping with us at home. Um, I'm going to start with a reading that's uh, familiar to many of us. I know we've, many of us have heard this before. Uh, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that's a psalm that, as I said, many of us have, have probably heard at various points throughout our lives. Maybe we, maybe we have it hanging in our house somewhere. Maybe we've, we've heard it at, at, at worship services and often at funerals and, and times when we gather to, to celebrate together or to grieve together or just to, just to be together and to, to be reminded that uh, we, we have a shepherd who watches over us. We, uh, we're, we as, as a flock of sheep, have the, the care and the guidance and the love of one who, who knows each of us by name. We're going to be talking a, uh, a little bit later today about um, Jesus as the good shepherd, about what it means that we have uh, a good shepherd in Jesus and um, how he guides us both in, in the good times besides still waters, both in the times when, when things are going well, but also in the scary times as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Um, and, and how important it is for us to be mindful of that, how important it was for, for the psalmist to be mindful of that, that in the, the moments in, in, in his life when he struggled, um, he had that, that care, he had that guidance, he had that love of one who, who knew the way and one who was watching over him every step of the way. And that's the God we worship today. That's the God we, we come to, uh, to, to, to lift up in, in, in prayer and song and, and to um, to hear a word from him in his, in, in his scriptures and to, to gather at his table. It's, it's a God who, who knows each of us. He knows the burdens we carry. He knows, each, he, he knows what each of us is going through, um, and he walks with us through it all. And so today, as we, as we, as we worship this, this shepherd together, let's, let's lift his name up. Um, a couple of things to, to, to be mindful of. Um, first, we want to continue praying for, for Donna Gardner. I know that um, many of you have probably heard she, she had surgery on Thursday, heart surgery, and it went well, but, but we definitely want to keep um, praying for, for her recovery. And so we want to, uh, we want to be, um, as, as we pray today and as we, as we go to God today, let's, let's continue to be mindful of her. Um, so now let's join together as we worship and let's um, give thanks to, to a God who is our good shepherd, who walks with us beside still waters, through the valley of the shadow of death, and who, who leads us in, in paths of righteousness. Let's worship him together. If you will, stand together, and we're going to sing some songs that are going to be familiar to, uh, I'm sure, many of you, and maybe uh, a couple that may not be as familiar, but I, I think we'll catch them on. <clears throat> him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious to the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. the Lord of heaven, one with the Father known, one with the Spirit through him given from yonder glorious soul. To thee be endless praise, for thou for us hast died, 
of blood to every believer the promise of God the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon
Let's listen to God's word together from Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You may be seated. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He's a great shepherd. Before we pray together, I thought I'd take a moment to uh, defend my wife's honor a little bit. She prepares the bulletin, and up until about an hour or so ago, this was accurate. But we have uh, frequently things that change in the last minute, so uh, so it's a little bit out of order from how the bulletin is written, but it's not her fault, so I just wanted to mention that. Uh, let's pray. God, we thank you for just another opportunity to come and gather in this place and lift up your name and praise you. And we read in the Psalms, in Psalm 96, that all creation rejoices before you. And uh, in that Psalm, it says the heavens rejoice, the, the earth rejoices, the sea, the fields, the forests, and all that are within them. And we too are here to rejoice today uh, because of who you are and because of what you've done and the things that we see around us that point to you. Uh, we're especially thankful that in this time of year for the beauty of the earth, uh, the, the life uh, that is springing up in this season, and uh, the many things that, that we get to enjoy, the, the beauty that's all around us in this place in which we live, and we're so grateful for that. We're thankful as well for, for many new friends uh, that, that we've met in uh, recent months here in this congregation. We've got quite a few new people 
uh, coming and attending and worshiping with us and joining the church. We're so grateful for that, uh, for the people that you bring into our lives, even as we continue to celebrate and are grateful for the people that have always been there, uh, people that are among our family and friends that have faithfully been in our lives. But uh, we're grateful for, for all those that you've had in our lives. And coming off of last week's Easter celebration, we are especially mindful of and thankful for our salvation, for what Christ has done for us, for uh, the joy that comes from knowing how much you love us and how far you would go for us and how far you have gone for us and what that means for us in the future, the promises that you've made to us for the future and how that's something that's available to all, that, that we have an opportunity not just to receive for ourselves, but to share with others. We're so thankful for that. We also come this morning thankful for answered prayers, especially this week. Uh, we're thankful for uh, the answered prayers for Donna Gardner, for John Garland, uh, who are both dealing with some uh, serious health concerns or, or procedures this last week, and uh, you faithfully healed and helped them both. Uh, John is now home, and, and Donna is recovering, and we continue to pray for both of them and their recovery, and we come to you uh, in moments like this when we see your faithfulness, your, the ways that you answer our prayers, uh, to continue to lift up to you others that we know have needs and, uh, and that we, we want to call your attention to or, or that our hearts are turned to, uh, asking for your, your faithfulness and helping and healing them as well. Uh, we pray for a, a family friend of ours, Mary Beth Francisco, who's, who's dealing with a, a diagnosis still uh, that she received recently. We continue to pray for Aaron Roberts, a neighbor of the Beckmans, who was injured in an ATV accident. We pray for Bailey Oates, who's waiting on some test results, and Natalie uh, Arrowood as she continues to recover from an injury, and Kelly Arrowood and, and some ongoing health issues that she's facing. We just ask that you be with them and, and bless them and give them comfort and healing and, uh, and good news, we hope, in the, in the near future. We continue to pray for Lake and Renfro and her daughter Paisley and some of their health concerns, for the Kaiser family and especially for Chelsea. We pray for Neil DiCiato's sister, Joyce, on hospice care and many others that we have on our prayer list that are struggling with something or in health care or homebound uh, that we just want to continue to remember and lift up and, um, and check in on and, and let them know that we love them, that we care about them, and we know that, that you're with them as well. We pray for other things coming up uh, here in the community and, and here in ministry. I pray especially for this upcoming Wednesday uh, merge event at the YMCA where we have a gathering of several youth groups coming together to worship uh, and, and hear your word and spend time in fellowship with one another. So grateful for that opportunity and pray that you would move hearts and change lives through that experience. God, we also lift up to you some of the faithful missions that we support. Uh, East Tennessee Christian Home and Academy is something that means a lot to a lot of us, and we are continuing to pray for them all throughout this month, the work that they do to uh, provide a home for, um, for young girls to come and, and grow and, and learn and, and be in a, a different environment where they can thrive than maybe uh, situations that they're coming out of uh, that might be more challenging. Uh, we pray for uh, the faculty and students of Philippine College of Ministry uh, and pray that you continue to be with them and bless the work that they're doing in that place. And pray as well for, for Johnson University, uh, an organization that means a lot to me uh, as a Johnson, Florida graduate. I am so thankful uh, for the time that I spent uh, in college with the professors and fellow students that I had and how that shaped me and the people that invested in my life. And we're, we're thankful to support organizations like this and, and help them continue to do the good work that they're doing. And may we also go from here in the rest of our time of worship and in the rest of our week and the rest of this month and just continue to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And may we also practice resurrection in all that we do and how we love and treat one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. So as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, I want to read briefly today from um, a passage in John chapter 20. Um, a story that, again, is, is probably pretty familiar to us, 
um, that follows the resurrection. So this is John chapter 20, uh, verses 24 and following. It says, Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Um, I was reading an article earlier this week by a theologian named Jonathan Heaps, but, and, and he was talking about this passage and just the oddity, uh, and, and, and the oddity in a lot of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances, but especially this one, the, the focus that's placed on the wounds. Um, you know, this is the one where it's, where it's most evident and it's most emphasized. And almost, almost to a kind of humorous extent, Thomas is saying, I won't believe unless I can actually see the wounds, unless I can actually see the scars on Jesus. And this, of course, is, is coming from a place of deep grief for Thomas. He's lost his, his, his Messiah. He's lost his rabbi. He's lost the, the one that he had followed. Um, and he's having a hard time believing that he might be alive. And so he makes this statement, unless I see the wounds, unless I see the scars. And then Jesus appears. And again, John in his gospel makes a point of Jesus pointing out the wounds. Look, Thomas, look at my scars. Stick your hand into my side. There's a real, a, a real focus and an emphasis. And, and Heaps is talking about how, how strange this is in some ways, right? That Jesus, who in so many ways after his resurrection is glorified, in so many ways, he's, he's able to walk through doors. He's able to, you know, there's this sense that um, he, he, is, he has a glorified presence, and yet he still bears the scars of his crucifixion. Those haven't gone away. At the same time, they don't seem to be causing him any pain, right? He's not, he's not, he's not still pained by the scars. If, if, if Thomas does, in fact, reach his hand out and put it into his side, um, it's not indicated here that this causes discomfort for Jesus or anything like that. And so you've got this, this image of Jesus after his resurrection where he is glorified, he has triumphed over death, and yet he still has these wounds. He still has these scars, which of course prompts the question, why? And one of the, one of the best answers that I think we can, we can come to, maybe not the only answer, but certainly an answer that we come to when we think about that is, is those scars are there to, to, to demonstrate the depth of his love, this, this reality that even and especially in his glory, even and especially in, in this moment where he's triumphed over death, he retains the scars so that we can, we can look and, 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 and see um, God's glory and God's love for us manifest, not just in the, the, the glorious presence, but also in the, in the wounds that he bears. It points forward to, to, the, to the time in, in Revelation when we see, um, uh, when John has a vision of a lamb sitting on the throne in all his triumph, and yet it's a lamb who was slain, a lamb that still bears the marks of suffering as a reminder um, that this love that God has for us is, is not cheap. It's not easy. It comes, with, uh, with, it comes at a cost. It comes with a great cost, uh, a sacrificial cost. Um, and so in Jesus' scars um, are not just a reminder of his suffering, but also a reminder of of what God accomplishes um, through and in the, the sacrificial love of his son. We need signs. Thomas needed to see to believe. And for all the criticism Thomas has received through the, through the generations, we call him Doubting Thomas, I think we can sympathize with this desire to, to have something tangible, to have something that we can see, some evidence of what it is we say we believe. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that we needed something tangible to remember and to celebrate and to, to honor and to glorify who he was and what he had done. And so he gives us tangible signs. Um, he gives us the bread 
as, as a tangible sign of the body that was broken. He gives us the cup as a tangible sign of the blood that was spilled. So while we can't stand here with Thomas and, and stick our hand into Jesus' side or touch the marks in his hand, we do have these tangible reminders of the depth of his love. We have these tangible reminders of the marks that he bore for us and for our salvation. So as we break the bread today, as we drink from the cup, let's be thankful that our Lord and our God, uh, the one that did so many miraculous signs that they can't even be recorded, is the one in, whose, whose sacrificial love is, is, is uh, testified to by the marks in his hands, by the, the mark in his side. And that by believing in him, by remembering him, by honoring him, we may have life in his name. As we gather at your table, as we listen to your word, help us know. God, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time that we have here together. God, we know that time is our greatest possession, our most precious possession. And to spend that time together this morning, uh, to come and worship you, and to learn more about who you are, is special. So God, we, we thank you for these times that we have uh, that we can spend together to remember your son and to sing praises to you. God, we thank you for who you've been throughout the years, your faithfulness and love and direction. God, that, that Jesus was there at, at creation and he gave up his seat of power to come and walk this earth as a man, to show us your heart, to show us who you are and how to live. God, he gave up his seat of power for a cross. And because of that, as Romans uh, reminds us, uh, nothing can separate us from you. God, that's, that's a gift that's uh, almost beyond understanding. And yet we're here this morning, God, to, to remember that cross to remember Jesus dying on that cross for us. 
the love that he poured out, the love that you poured out on us. Uh, God is a precious gift, and we thank you for that this morning. So as we eat this bread, we remember your son. As we drink this juice, we remember your son. And we give, we give you glory, or we give you thanks for that. It's in his name we pray. Amen. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he was in, his up, in the upper room with his disciples. He took the bread, he broke it and blessed it. He said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Likewise, after the meal, Jesus took the cup, he poured it, said, this cup is my blood of the new covenant. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. God, at this time, we, we pause to bring financial gifts to you. God, we know that we can never buy our way into heaven. We can never serve our way into heaven. God, that's, that's a debt we can never pay. The gift you gave us was given freely and was given with love. And we're thankful for that. And part of, part of our thankfulness is giving back in ways that we can. Right now we give, we give money to help further the, uh, to further the, the ministry of this church and ministries around the world. But God, we also know that part of giving back, part of ourselves is using our time, our talents, our intelligence, things that you've blessed us with. To help others, to help others around us in this community, to show your love to them, uh, and to to show them uh, your love in our lives. So God, we we pray that uh, this money would be fruitful or would would do good things, and that we likewise with our lives uh, and the things that you've given us uh, would be fruitful this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
as the kids head downstairs for Children's Church, we are uh, continuing to, to look at God's Word and the Gospel of John. So today we're going to be reading from uh, John chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. Let's listen to God's Word together. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Please pray. God, we give you thanks for the the word that you give us, Lord, the word that is your son Jesus and the way that he is revealed in your scriptures. And God, we we pray, Lord, that as we listen to your word, as we hear your word, Lord, as we hear the, the word that's been passed down to us through prophets and, and evangelists, Lord, from, from Isaiah to Jeremiah to Matthew and John and, and to Paul, uh, Lord, we pray that we would receive that and we would hear you and, and see you in it. God, we pray that we would have hearts and minds that are open to what you have to say to us and that our lives might be transformed. So be with us today, Lord, as we, as we reflect and, and meditate on um, this good news that you give us through your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen. Throughout the, the history of, of theology and the arts, which is a, a field of study, it's one of the areas of study that that I get pretty excited about, thinking about how theological things are represented in arts and and literature. One question that has always presented an inordinate amount of difficulty has been the question of what heaven is like. That is, when we think about heaven, beyond just the question of even being able to define exactly what we mean or what we're getting at when we talk about heaven, what do we envision? These renderings, it's, it's not surprising, can range from things that are kind of trite and sentimental and even laughable, to the truly inspiring. As a kid, I can remember being introduced to some of the more lowbrow answers to this question via Far Side comics and Bugs Bunny cartoons, all of which presented a vision of the hope we have beyond the grave in ways that were less than compelling. Billowing clouds populated by angelic versions of our former selves, strumming harps as we float through the ether, not exactly an exciting picture of an eternal existence. A little bit later, I encountered somewhat more substantial and I would say somewhat more illuminating, but no less imaginative renderings of heaven in in works like Dante's Paradiso and C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce. But for all the the vivid and, and powerful and emotionally charged language that a reader might find in these works and others, getting a full sense of what we're truly talking about when we talk about heaven or the kingdom of heaven or this, this life that we talk about when we talk about heaven, all of this still remains somewhat elusive. 
At every turn, Paul's statement that no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him is proven true by our inability to adequately grasp what it might look like to dwell in the presence of God. Dante, in his work, The Paradiso, ultimately says that his poetic capabilities can't do justice to what awaits us at the end of our earthly pilgrimage. He says it's like trying to square a circle. But it's enough to make him want to live out that journey faithfully for as long as God gives him a path to walk. And I would presume that this is exactly how God wants it. Rather than giving us complete and conclusive answers, God gives us burning questions. Rather than an all-consuming tapestry, God gives us glimpses of his beauty. Rather than full bellies, God gives us a hunger for his promises and a taste of what is to come rather than the the whole thing. See, God knows that as human beings, we are always going to have a tendency to to jump past or to, to look past what is right in front of us. We'll ignore the business of the day in favor of exclusively focusing on what is to come. And God does want us to anticipate joyfully the culmination of the hope that we have in him. But he also wants us to realize that eternity, eternal life, begins now. Rather than waiting for some moment in the future when all of a sudden we'll find ourselves in heaven and our our life in, in God's presence and in communion with him will then begin, he wants us to embrace the opportunities that he gives us as long as it is called today, to step into a new resurrection life a life that gives a new shape to everything we do. He wants us to grow up in him, to commune with him, to serve him with an eternal focus, but in the ordinary and the everyday and the earthy realities that we occupy today in the here and now. Throughout Jesus' ministry in the Gospels, the refrain that he returned to at numerous times is, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Or as he puts it in Luke chapter 17, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Among other things, and I think Jesus probably meant a lot of rich and deep and complex things by by these statements, but at its heart, Jesus seems to have been saying that he was embodying and inaugurating a kingdom that the people had long been waiting for, and which was now coming to life right before their eyes if they would have the vision to see it. And there are numerous metaphors that Jesus used and that we can use when talking about the kingdom of God. And every one of them is so much more life-changing and life-giving than the the harp and cloud visions that we've inherited. But the one we're going to look at today is one that we return to again and again. Not only for what it tells us about ourselves, not only for what it tells us about the existence to which we've been called, but also for what it tells us about the one who has called us, the one who has made this existence possible. It's the image that Jesus unpacks in John chapter 10. It's an image that unfolds within the earthy context occupied by sheep and their shepherd. And at the heart of this passage are a couple of questions that I think we would do well to wrestle with whenever we contemplate God's kingdom, God's eternal kingdom, and our place in it. The first is a variation on the question that I posed earlier about how we envision heaven, but it's a version of the question that I think is is more in line with what this passage is about and, and far less likely to point us to 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 sentimental and ultimately toothless visions that we see so often in cartoons. It's a question that is so crucial to grasping at God's promises. And that is, what does abundant life look like? In verse 10, Jesus proclaims that he has come that we might have life and have it to the full. As some translations say, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. That's all well and good, but, but if we want to cling to this, as something like a hope that we can build our life on, it's good to have some notions, some ideas about what this abundant life, about what this life to the full might be like. In a recent conversation that some of us from FCC got to have with some members from other local churches a while back, we we were asked to simply make a list of what comes to mind when we think of the phrase abundant life or life to the full. It included things like laughter, joy, Music, beauty, good food, good work, good rest, good conversation. Compassion that we share with one another and that we receive from one another. A feeling that we belong, as well as a lot of other items. In short, this this vision of abundant life is something that all of us there, and I imagine all of us here, 
can immediately recognize as something we would like to be a part of. It's a vision of a life that we all long for, not only because it fills up our aching absences, but also because it reminds us of those times when we were happiest, those times when we most experience God's grace and goodness in our lives. And it points forward to a time when we might experience those things to the full. But for so many people in Jesus' day, as in our own, this vision of abundant life, of full life, seems less like a reality in our midst and more like an impossible dream. And that bears asking why. Why in our lives as individuals do we so often struggle to take hold of the abundant life, the, the life to the full that God promises? Why in our life and community do we so often settle for second-rate versions of the wholeness and the holiness that God holds out as his kingdom vision of abundance? And here we get back to this instructive metaphor that Jesus gives us of sheep. In this parable, Jesus challenges us to, to think of ourselves as sheep because in so many ways, that's what we are. Jesus' original audience would have recognized the parallels more readily than we do because, as we've talked about numerous times before, we don't often have a lot of opportunities to spend much time around sheep. We don't know what makes sheep tick. We don't know how their sheep brains operate. But, but Jesus and his original hearers would have known that sheep aren't exactly intelligent, let alone wise, in the ways we, we usually think about those things. They're not exactly daring, let alone courageous. Often sheep don't really know what's best for them, and they don't know how to take hold of it. Maybe most significantly, for the purposes of, of, of what we're thinking about today here in John chapter 10, sheep don't always know the difference or don't deeply consider the difference between the pen and the pasture. And I'll say up front that we talked about this chapter a few weeks ago on, uh, on Wednesday night during our Wednesday night discussion, and one of the most illuminating things for me about that conversation was how we as a group teased out some of the distinctions between the pen and the pasture. See, the pen, as any sheep or any shepherd knows, certainly has a lot going for it. Within the narrow, fenced-in boundaries of a pen, the sheep are going to have some measure of safety. They're going to have a certain amount of security. They'll have some grass to eat. They'll have the comfort that comes from being in a familiar place. The pen, as any sheep would tell us, is a pleasant place to be. But it's not pasture, which is really what this passage is pointing towards. See, pasture involves wide open spaces. It involves room to roam. It involves a greater amount of freedom, but it also involves no small amount of danger. To venture out into the pasture means being more exposed, more vulnerable, more open to attack, more open to getting hurt. Given all of this, it's not difficult to see why in our lives as individuals and as communities, we so often prefer the pen to the pasture. But this is not the life that God intends for us, the guarded sort of life that embraces what's comfortable, what's safe, and what's easy over the radical kind of freedom and the abundant kind of hope that, that God has made possible through his covenant promises, the overwhelming new reality that he has revealed through the life and death and resurrection of his son, Recently, I got to hear some, about some research that uh, a former student at Milligan had done about some of the ways that the church in Ireland had, had abused um, people, and, and particularly women, over a period of more than 100 years. And one of the phrases that kept coming up in her research stuck with me. There's a scholar on Irish history, and, and, and he used the words architecture of containment to describe what the church in Ireland had been about. And I imagine maybe he, he was meaning some things that I might not necessarily mean when I use these phrases, but... But even stepping away from an exploration of the horrible patterns of abuse that this student was reading and writing about, that phrase, architecture of containment, stuck out to me. And it, and it can certainly apply in all sorts of ways to the kind of existence that the church has sometimes embodied, the kind of existence we in the church gravitate towards at the expense of abundant life. We embrace the familiarity of what we know over the risk that comes with allowing the Spirit to move in our lives. We cling to old habits and perspectives rather than letting go of the security that comes with our former ways of life. We worry so much about keeping people, including ourselves, in the pen where we're safe that we fail to venture out. We fail to be exposed a little bit to things that 
that might scare us. That might even hurt us. And we fail to invite others into the fold, the sheep that might not look like part of our flock, at least immediately, but who are longing for the kind of hope and the kind of grace and the kind of life that at our best we are called to embody and to share. So moving from pen to pasture can be scary. It can be terrifying. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not something that should be taken lightly. And so this brings us to the second, second major question that I think this passage confronts us with. Beyond simply asking, what does abundant life look like? Or even what does pasture look like? We're also compelled to ask, whom do we trust to take us there? Whom do we follow when we want to make our way to this abundant life, this life to the full that we long for? And here the answers are going to be varied. And our experience shows us that time and time again, we might make the wrong choice. In this passage, Jesus talks about a few different options. He mentions the stranger whose voice is unknown to the sheep. He mentions the thieves and robbers who might make their way into the pen so that they can steal and kill and destroy. He mentions wolves who come after the flock to satisfy their own hunger. He talks about the hired hand who doesn't really care about the sheep. And when the rubber meets the road, that hired hand will do what he needs to do to save his own skin rather than looking after the sheep he's been entrusted with. In our own lives, we can update this list. We can rattle off all the potential voices and influences that we might be tempted to follow or that we might be compelled to trust as we look for pasture, as we long to embrace this abundant life that we hunger after. Our own desires, shaped by everything from the commercials we see to the pressure of the crowd to the self-centeredness that rears its head at the worst times. These desires can lead us toward pastures where instead of finding abundance and freedom, we find more architecture of containment. We become imprisoned to these emotions and anxieties and temptations that keep us mired in, in sinful habits. The numerous loud voices, some in the church and some outside the church, some speaking from pulpits and some speaking from social media accounts and some speaking through whichever megaphone that our culture hands them can lead us astray by constantly urging us to pursue a vision of happiness and fulfillment and self-determination and power and prosperity that stands in contrast with God's vision of the kingdom or of pasture. There were thieves and there were wolves and there were hired hands in Jesus' day, just as there are thieves and wolves and hired hands in our own day. And then as now, the only way we can resist their call, the only way we can escape the confines of the pen to find real pasture rather than a cheap imitation is to fix our eyes and ears, to fix our hearts and minds, and to place our trust and hope in the good shepherd. To cut through all of the noise and, and all of the garbage that threatens to stand between us and the one who knows us by name, the one who loves us with a love that is pure, a love that is unconditional, a love that nothing can separate us from the one who wants to draw us out of our sinful and selfish realities into a kingdom of abundant grace and mercy and truth and joy. And he wants this so much that he is willing, like the good shepherd he talks about, to lay down his life for his sheep so that we can get there. We want to look to him and to ask where he is leading us. And then not just ask the question, but then to follow. The answer to our question, what is heaven like, is the same as it always was. It's a life of communion with our good shepherd, our resurrected Lord. A life in his presence that begins now when we turn our eyes away from, from the thieves and the wolves and the hired hands that don't care about us. And we look to the one who gave himself for us and for our salvation. But our resurrection hope tells us that even if that, that abundant life begins now, it doesn't end now. It continues into eternity as we make our way with countless other sheep through the valley of the shadow of death, beside still waters, and into pastures of abundant and never-ending life where we will dwell forever with the only shepherd who can truly be called good. Please pray with me. God, we, we live in a world that's, that's full of would-be shepherds. And Lord, as your word reminds us, all we like sheep have gone astray. We need a shepherd to, to look to, to follow, uh, to trust. And God, we thank you that 
in a world that was full of shepherds, your, your son stepped into that world and demonstrated for us what it looks like to, to know his sheep by name, to, to love us so deeply that he was willing to lay down his life for his sheep, that he might provide a way, that he might be the gate that, that leads us out of the pen and into the pasture, that leads us into your presence, that leads us into this eternal and abundant and uh, overwhelmingly beautiful life that we long for and hunger for. God, we thank you that uh, your son brought this kingdom life as a reality, not just as something that's far off, not just as something that uh, we, we may or may not see someday, but as something that is coming to life among us through him, through his spirit, Lord, in the ways that, that you work through him among your people and in this world. God, help us to take hold of that resurrection life and to begin living it now that we might live it eternally. Lord, that, that one day we might gather around the throne of the lamb who was slain, our good shepherd who is also our lamb. Uh, Lord, we might uh, sing his praises uh, in your presence forever. It's in his name that we pray these things. Amen. So as John 10 reminds us, um, in this world, as, as we make our way through this world, there are going to be all kinds of voices that say, follow me. Um, there are going to be all kinds of voices that, that say they know the way to, to pasture or to happiness or to joy or to uh, the kind of abundant life we, we hunger for. But as Jesus says here, he is the good shepherd. He is the gate for the sheep. And he calls us by name. He, he calls us to follow him. And when we read the Gospels, uh, we, we see over and over again when Jesus says, follow me. Um, some reject him, some don't, but, but many do. Peter and Andrew, James and John, they leave their nets. Matthew uh, leaves his tax collector's booth. People like Mary Magdalene and Mary and Martha and, and Lazarus leave their former ways behind and give their lives over to this, uh, to this good shepherd who's in their midst. And as I said earlier, even though Jesus is not standing before us physically today, showing us his wounds, um, even though Jesus is not here to stand before us and say, follow me, he still speaks to us. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through his spirit and in the ways that his spirit works in us and among us and through us, and he still calls us to follow him. And we set aside time each week to respond to that call. And um, it's not a question of whether we're sheep, because we are sheep. <laughs> the question is just simply, uh, where we're going to find ourselves, what pen, what, what pasture we're looking for, and what shepherd we're going to follow. And so we set aside time that, that we sheep can respond to that call. And so if you haven't made that decision in your life, this is a time when you can do that. You can uh, confess his name. You can be baptized into, into his name and, and begin following uh, this path that he lays out, which will sometimes lead us through the valley of the shadow of death. It will lead us um, into places that we're not always comfortable with, but, but he, he leads us to pasture. It's also a time for those of you who have made that decision, but you're looking for, for other people to, to walk alongside and to serve alongside. If you want to join us here at First Christian, you can do that as well. And then finally, it's just a time for those of you who need prayer. We would love to pray with you and pray for you. And if any of this is tough to do in front of a group of people, please talk to somebody before you leave today. Let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. Let us see what God's doing in your life. Now, let, as, uh, as Rob leads us, let's uh, stand and worship him. If you have a decision to make, please come forward.
been a joy, as always, to, to get to be with you all this morning and, and worship, uh, those of you who are here in the sanctuary and also uh, those of you at home. Um, in a moment, I'm going to close in prayer, but I guess before we do, just a, a few announcements. First of all, Wednesday night, um, most of our uh, usually scheduled Wednesday night activities are happening, but the youth group is uh, is doing merge this week, I believe, and so they will meet at the Y at 6. If you have more questions about that, um, you can talk to Andy or Kim, probably, and uh, they can they can uh, answer some questions about that for you. But that's a, it's a great opportunity for the youth group to get together with um, other youth groups in the area and and spend some time at the Y together, playing and 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 uh, fellowshipping, but also worshiping and and and, and praying together and, and and learning and growing together. So that's um, that's Wednesday night. Um, the rest of us will be doing our normally scheduled activities. So a meal at 5:45 in the fellowship hall. So join us for that if you can. Um, followed at 6.30 by um, Action Theater and Wednesday night um, conversations for the adults over here in, in the Sunday school room. So if you have any questions about those, um, those events, uh, let us know. We'd love to, I'd love to have you join us. Um, even though we're, we're coming to the end of, of, of kind of our spring semester, it's always a good time to, to get involved. It's always a good time to, to kind of be a part of the things that, that we're doing midweek. It's just a great time to, to encourage one another and pray for each other and, and grow together. Um, Another thing that I wanted to just kind of put, put out in front of everybody, um, some of you have maybe heard, we've talked a little bit about um, Karen Share, which is a, a ministry that's been um, operational here in, uh, in, in, um, in Irwin, here in Unicoi County for, um, for, for decades now. And um, we're, we're currently going through kind of a, um, some, some, some transition there, I guess we could say, um, kind of building on the, the great leadership that, that Karen Share has had in recent years. And, and um, doing some things like uh, forming a new board and, and, and getting some, some, some new volunteers and some new energy and just um, kind of helping to revitalize the mission of Care and Share, um, which I guess I should have said is a, is, a, is a benevolence ministry. It helps people here in the community who are having a hard time with, with food and clothes and assistance in, in various ways. Um, and so all that is to say, if you're interested in helping out in any way with that and volunteering right now, um, the, the volunteer schedule is, is just Wednesday mornings, but that's going to expand 
um, as time goes on. If you're interested in serving in, in any way in that ministry um, and, and, uh, and, and would like to, or just would like to know more about that, um, there's a few of us you can talk to. You can talk to the Beckmans. Uh, you can talk to, to, to Ben Boer, who's, who's been, um, been, I know, um, helping out in, in a lot of ways. Uh, you can uh, talk to, uh, to, to me, um, to Dean and Mary Claire, um, and there's probably others, too, that I'm forgetting, but we might be able to answer some questions about how you might, how you might volunteer, how you might um, serve that ministry, um, and, and if nothing else, just please be in prayer for that ministry as we, as we seek to, um, to, to, to try to do some, some, some good work here in Irwin, along with a lot of other churches, a lot of other people from here in the community who are helping out. Um, to, to help the people that, that are most in need here. So if you have questions about Care and Share, definitely let us know, and we'd love to point you in the right direction. Um, any other announcements? I have one. Yeah. Uh, so every year we have the Action Theater store, which the kids earn Action Theater bucks through Wednesday night programming, um, and that store is going to happen in two weeks. Uh, not this Wednesday, but the next. And so if you have things around the house that... Um, kind of have a fresh look on them, um, and you want to donate them, that would be great for the kids to purchase for the store. Also, last year, um, we provided um, experiences for the kids. So, um, like, uh, a hiking trip with Ben, I think, was one of them. Um, uh, a photography lesson with Mr. Andy. Things like that. If you, if you have something like that, you have talent or a gift that you would like to share or to do with the kids, uh, talk to me, and maybe we can put that on the list. Um, so there's just a couple opportunities, not just, we don't want the kids to just have all material things, but also maybe some experiences um, with uh, other folks in the church. So that's in two weeks. Come talk to me if you got some ideas. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Any other announcements? All right, well, let's close in prayer. God, we thank you once again for this beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, for the... Uh, the abundant life, the life to the full that you hold out for us. Lord, we, we pray forgiveness for the times that we seek uh, lesser forms of life. For Lord, we ignore the, the hope that you, that you provide and, and go chasing after other things. But God, we thank you that, that you're there, and we thank you that you draw us into fellowship with you. You draw us into communion with each other and, and, and service uh, to your kingdom and, and to those around us. And God, we pray that as we leave this place today, we would embrace that life. We would um, share that life with, with those we meet. We would be ambassadors, uh, ministers, and missionaries of your kingdom. And Lord, that we would point to you. Uh, we would point to your love and your compassion and your truth and your grace in all that we do. Uh, it's in the name of your son, Jesus, and by the power of your Holy Spirit that we pray all these things. Amen. Go in peace.